Hi friends, this is Shalini and I am back to you with another video and today my topic is HIV and AIDS. I am doing this topic because most of us don't understand exactly what is the difference between HIV and AIDS. So if you like today's video and the content, kindly do like, share and subscribe. Also let me know your valuable comments in the comment box. So let us begin. So HIV and AIDS. HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. So this is the virus that attacks the immune system causing the disease. On the other hand, AIDS. AIDS is otherwise called as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It is a group of diseases that occurs only at a later stage in an individual who is infected with this virus. So this is a seven stage life cycle that I have put. There are various st uh, stages in the cycle. First one is binding, fusion, then the reverse transcription, integration, replication, assembly and budding. So this is what exactly happens to the virus after it enters to your body. How does it replicate and how does it destroy the immune system in your body? So the first process is called as binding. So this is the HIV virus. The H this is the HIV virus and this orange and the blue color that you see is the CD4 cell. So what happens exactly? In the first step that is binding, the HIV virus binds on to the receptor site of the CD4 cell. So that is the first step. Second step is a, is a process called as fusion. In this stage, the HIV envelope fuses with the membrane of the CD4 cell. So this is a CD4 cell and this is the HIV envelope. So this fuses with the CD4 cell membrane. That is the second step. The third step is called as reverse transcription. In this process, an enzyme is used called as reverse transcriptase. So what happens? These are the HIV viral RNA. The HIV viral RNA is converted to HIV DNA with the help of the enzyme called as reverse transcriptase. So this is the third step. What happens in the fourth step? Fourth step is a process called as integration. In this process, an enzyme called as integrase is used. Here what happens is the so formed HIV DNA gets integrated into the cell DNA. So this blue color spiral that you see is the CD4 cell DNA. Now the red color HIV DNA gets integrated into the cell DNA. So this is the fourth process called as integration. Next is a process called as replication. In replication viral RNA and viral proteins are created. So after the DNA gets integrated into the cell DNA then it starts replicating or producing RNA viral RNA. So these are the viral proteins and this is the viral RNA. This is the process called as replication. Next after replication the viral RNA and the protein gets assembled onto the circumference of the cell. This, this process is called as assembly. So after the sixth step, the immature HIV virus then is pushed out of the cell and then this immature uh, virus gets converted to mature virus is a process called as budding. This mature virus then starts infecting the other CD4 cells. So this is a seven stage cycle. That means what exactly happens to the virus and to your immune system and the CD4 cells after it enters into your body. So this is a more realistic picture of what I was trying to tell you. So this is the helper T cell or more specifically the CD4 cell. The HIV virus comes and binds onto the cell and fuses along the cell membrane. It gets inside, the RNA is converted to DNA. The DNA so form gets integrated into the cell DNA and then it starts replicating viral proteins and viral RNA. The immature HIV virus is formed which is let out of the cell and it starts destructing other helper T cells. So this is staging of this disease. Stage 1 is asymptomatic where the CD4 cell count reduces to 500 to 600 cells. Say stage 2 is where the infected person exhibits with minor symptoms and the cell count is between 350 to 500 cells per microliter. Stage 3 is the person exhibits with major symptoms and opportunistic diseases and the cell count is between 200 to 300 cells. And stage 4 is the 
stage called as AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, which is, as I told you, a later stage in an individual infected with the HIV virus and the cell count is, bit, is less than 200 cells. So what is the normal CD4 count? The normal CD4 count is between 500 to 1500 cells per cubic millimeter. Opportunistic infections versus CD4 cell count. So I was trying to tell you that there are certain infections which is acquired during the process of the disease and that those infections are called as opportunistic infections. These infections are acquired only in an individuals whose immunity is lower. So here you see the CD4 cell count is between 200 and 500. When the cell count is between 200 and 500, the infected individual is at a risk of acquiring pneumococcal and other bacteria infections, pulmonary tuberculosis, herpes zoster and oral thrush. When the cell count is less than 200, the individual is at risk of acquiring pneumocystic scarini pneumonia, extra pulmonary tuberculosis. When the cell count is less than 100, the individual is at a risk of acquiring toxoplasmosis, fungal infections like cryptococcus, penciliosis, cryptosporidiosis, esophageal candidiasis. When the cell count is less than 50, the individual is at a risk of acquiring disseminated cytomegalovirus and disseminated mycobacterium avium complex. So what are the symptoms of the disease? The individual might exhibit to you with lymph node enlargement, dry cough, pneumonia, sore throat, muscle pain, joint pain. Also, he might have headache and difficulty in concentrating, rashes, fever and night sweats. Also nausea, vomiting, diarrhea and thickening and curving of the nail. Weight loss or cachexia and fatigue is one of the major symptoms that a HIV patient would express to you with. So what is the dynamics of transmission of disease? Now this is something that you should really listen to. The high-risk population that is the female sex workers, men who have sex with men or what you call as homosexuals and people injecting drug or injecting drug users. This is the high-risk group. The people who are in contact with this primary group that is the high-risk group or the most infected group is called as a bridge population. That is the clients of the sex workers, partners of IUDs, migrant, migrant workers or migrant population or mobile population, truck drivers and population in conflict. So these these are the bridge population who are in contact with this primary group or with this high risk population. General population are in contact with this bridge population. Those are the married women, babies and children of these group of people, youth and men. So these, this is the general population that is in contact with the bridge population. This is another depiction of the dy dynamics of HIV transmission. This is the high risk group that you see which is almost 2.6 to 11 percentage of the people. This is the bridge population that connects the high risk group to the general population. So exposure route and transmission rate. Blood transmission as you see in this table has the highest rate of HIV transmission which is almost more than 98%. Perinatal transmission is discussed later. Sexual intercourse is also a route of transmission of HIV virus and is almost 0.1 to 1 percentage. Vaginal is 0.05 to 0.1 percentage. Anal is 0.065 to 0.5 percentage. Oral is 0.005 to 0.01 percentage. Injecting drug use is almost 0 to 67 percentage needle stick exposure is 0.3 percentage mucous membrane and splash to eye or oronasal root is almost 0.09 percentage let's come to the perinatal uh, transmission rate during pregnancy, it's only 5 to 10 percentage and breastfeeding is 5 to 20 percentage. But most of the studies tells that it is during labor and delivery that the HIV virus is transmitted higher. That is almost 10 to 15 percentage. Overall without breastfeeding is 15 to 25 percentage. Overall with breastfeeding up to 6 months is 20 to 35 percentage. Overall with breastfeeding till 18 to 24 months is almost 30 to 45 percentage. So, is kissing, hugging, sharing toilet seat, sharing food, insect bite, bathing, sneezing and coughing a mode of transmission? The answer is no, it is not the mode of transmission. HIV is not transmitted through air, water, saliva and sweat. It is transmitted through blood, milk and semen.
the diagnostic test there are various diagnostic tests to find out whether the, an individual is infected with hiv the first one is classified as screening test and the second one is supplement test the a is elisa that is enzyme link immunosorbent assay second one is rapid test and third one is simple test the simple test or the rapid test are done in countries which is resource poor or in resource poor laboratory settings where there is no skill technician or there is less of facilities is where you do simple or rapid test the test results can be elicited within 10 minutes to 2 hours but the place where you have efficient workers and uh, adequate facilities you can always go for elisa elisa will help you to differentiate between the variants of the virus that has affected the individual for example whether the individual is affected with hiv1 or whether the individual is affected to hiv2 or is it any other variant that is that the that has infected the individual also the other supplementary test called as western broad test indirect immunofluorescence test radio immunoprecipitation assay all of these are supplementary or confirmatory tests to confirm how accurate the elisa results are for example a person who has tested positive for elisa can always be te tested negative for western blot test so if an individual is negative for western blot test we presume that the elisa test is false positive so all of these tests is done to identify the presence of antibodies in the blood i'll tell you how so disease progression this is the relative presence of antibody which rises within two weeks two to ten weeks after the individual is infected with the virus the relative antibody con concentration rises and it remains at the st at the steady state or at a stagnant state th through 10 9 to 10 years of life so this is the relative antibody concentration the black color line that you see is the helper t cell or the cd4 cell which relatively decreases over the period of time so by 10 years the antibody the helper t cell concentration would have decreased the next thing is this blue line this blue line indicates the relative hiv concentration or the viral load which keeps on increasing the in, at the in the acute phase of the disease there is a relative increase but it, then it would decline for a period of time and in the longer course of the disease the relative concentration of the hiv virus would increase and would lead to aids so this is what I said before an HIV infection these are the CD4 cells in a sample that you see between week after the infection between weeks to months that is almost from two weeks to ten weeks or two to three two weeks to three months you see in the acute phase of the infection you see the this is the viral load and after the three months to certain years this is the pattern that you see in the viral load initially you will have lesser viral load but if it is not treated properly in chronic hiv infection the person would lead to something called as aids where the cd4 cells are totally destructed or the cd4 cells may fall below 50 cells and the viral load has totally increased what is the treatment? There is something called as antiretroviral therapy for HIV infection. In 1990s, up to 20 pills were taken daily at different intervals throughout the day to combat the infection. But today, as little as one pill is needed to combat the infection. Treatment of HIV is by various modes. You can give vaccines, microbicides. There is something called as pre-exposure prophylaxis. So what is pre-exposure prophylaxis? Pre-exposure prophylaxis is a FDA approved HIV prevention regimen. There is a daily pill called as Trivada which interferes with the virus's ability to replicate and is proven safe and effective. So how do you take the drug? PrEP is taken every, every day before the possible exposure. For example, there is a bridge population or the high risk population who are at risk of developing the disease. PrEP can be taken every day before the possible exposure. What is PEP or PEP that is post exposure prophylaxis. It is taken in emergency situations for example after a needle stick injury or after a sudden exposure within 72 hours after the possible exposure. This is at least within 72 hours. It, the, the drug is most effective or the post exposure prophylaxis is most effective when it is taken within 2 hours after the exposure. Nurses role. 
nurse's role is as follows community assessment and education education about what education about the available vaccines microbicides people who are injecting drug you should teach them clean techniques or sterile te techniques of injecting the drug male and female condoms cervical barriers male circumcision you must teach all your clients or all your patients about safe sex PMTCT which is prevention of mother to child transmission as we have discussed about the perinatal route or the labor the delivery during the breastfeeding after the delivery all of this there are different stages at which the mother can possibly infect the child so the mother has to be counseled about prevention of transmission ways how you can prevent HIV transmission to the child voluntary counseling and testing prep and pep which is already explained standard precautions what are the standard precautions hand washing use of protective barriers like gloves masks goggles and gowns safe handling and safe disposal of sharps fast track targets so the fast track target the key 2020 target is as follows out of 100 percentage of the individuals who are infected with the virus at least 90 percent should know that they are aware that they are infected with the virus of which at least 90 percentage should be on treatment and of which 90 percentage there should be suppression of the viral load so this was the 2020 fast track target that 2030 fast track target is out of the 100 percentage population who are infected with HIV 95 percentage should be aware of their disease of which 95 percentage should take treatment of which 95 percentage should have suppression of the viral load so we expect the target of 2 lakhs that is a steady decline from 5 lakhs to 2 lakhs in 2030 with zero discrimination live life to the fullest because it occurs only once so thank you i hope that today's video was useful for each of you and if you have your topics of interest any doubts comments and clarifications please let me know as well have a great day ahead bye guys